holy is set apart. God is holy. We as followers of Jesus are called to be holy. That means we do life Jesus' way, not the world's way. One of the most convoluted and confusing places of life for us to get mixed up between Jesus' way and the world's way is in relationship. We have all learned relationship. Some of it is very awesome. Some of it is very broken. Either way, we have been exposed to relationship over and over again. We have created a theology and pattern to the way we do relationship. Is it Jesus' way of relationship? Some of us really don't know. Through living Jesus' way, to be holy, you will reclaim your relationships, your marriage, your sexuality, and how you navigate conflict. Hey there, welcome to Real Life Online. My name is Michael. I'm so excited to be with you. Spend a couple of minutes together today. Uh, We are continuing in our series called Holy. And this is really, uh, we're talking about living a holy life, uh, a life that is following Jesus in his ways. His, his ways are different. They're way better than your ways. They're way better than my ways. And, and, and it's God's way. It's different. It's set apart. It's holy. And specifically, we're talking about holy relationships and uh, relationships God's way. And what's fun about relationships is they're messy, like really messy. Why? Because you're messy. And I'm sometimes messy. And in relationships, we run into conflict. And, and, and sometimes conflict in relationships is, is dealt with like, like it's a bad word. Oh no, we have conflict. We're not doing relationships right. And I just want to tell you, it's not true. Every relationship you will ever have is going to have conflict. It's the nature of relationships. It's what you do with that conflict. It's how you walk through it that either determines it's a good relationship, a stronger relationship, a deeper godly relationship, a holy relationship, or not. And so we want to learn how do we handle conflict God's way? Because honestly, the truth is we're really bad at it. Like really bad. Like you're really bad at it. I'm really bad at it. And and it starts... In the very beginning of our history, if we look back to the first humans, Adam and Eve, they were bad at conflict. God created them. They're in perfect relationship with God and with each other. And God says, hey, just don't do this one thing. They go and do that one thing. And then all of a sudden, conflict erupts. God goes, so hey, you did that one thing I told you not to. Well, it was because of her. She's the reason. Well, no, no, it's not my fault. It's that the snake's fault. Well, it's the conflict. We don't know how to walk through it in a godly way. You look at their kids, uh, Cain and Abel. There's some conflict over which offering is more pleasing to the Lord. And so the natural step is, I'm going to murder my brother because that's how we deal with conflict. We are bad at it. And then if we look to the world, man, the world is no better You just look at the history books, all the different world wars, even the wars that are raging now. It is so bad, the conflict. We don't know how to navigate it. I even think of the last several months in our country, in America here. It just proves we don't know how to deal with conflict in a good way. And and I want to speak to this specifically. It's happening both inside the church. We don't know how to deal with conflict and outside the church. So we can't just throw stones at the world. It's happening in our families, in our church bodies. And the, the, the tension is we want to divide and we want to pick sides and have people choose sides with us, preferably our side. And we don't want to have good discussions, hard discussions that really work towards unity and, and restoration and being able to walk forward together. No, we want to have people be on our side and then we want to demonize the other side, whatever that other side is. It's not my side, so they're wrong and I'm right. And that rarely works in relationship. It's hard to move forward together when you're always looking at the other person as the enemy. Again, both inside the church and outside the church. God has a better way, a different way. And just for practical sake, I mean, you could try this. You could try that kind of tactics. Like if you're married, you could go to your wife. Hey, babe, like everything you do is wrong. I don't like it. I can't believe you said that, did that, all of these things. Hey, you want to go to bed? It's not going to work out well. You're going to end up on the couch or somewhere else, right? That's not how you handle conflict. It just doesn't work. And why? Because our way of thinking is broken. It's 
corrupted by sin and, and selfishness. And, and we need another way. And the world needs to see another way, Jesus' way. Those of us who have put our faith in Jesus, we're called to relationships a different way, God's way. We're called to walk through conflict a different way, God's way. And God's design uh, for relationship is always about reconciliation. God's design is reconciliation. That basically means a, rest a restoration of relationship, which uh, if a relationship is broken, God's design is to bring them back together. That's what he's done with us, right? And we'll, we'll talk about the gospel, the good news about how God is trying to reconcile people back to himself. But this is the tension that we live in. There's brokenness in relationship, and God's design is to bring those back together. And I love Paul. He's encouraging the church in Rome, and he writes this letter to them. And I just want to share a couple of, of uh, scriptures from it. It starts in Romans 12, verse 1. Here's what he says to the church. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is tr the truly, this is truly the way to worship him. Listen to this. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of the world. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world. I'm going to pause for just a second. Why? Because this world is not your home. If you've put your faith in Jesus, your home is in heaven with God for eternity. We are merely passing through this life, this world. And so don't, don't copy the behavior and customs of this broken, fallen world. Instead, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. So we need a change we need to change the way we're thinking. We need to not look to this world, its customs, and to, to, to form our beliefs and behavior system. We need to look to God and allow God to transform us, to change us. We need a biblical filter for relationship because if we look and model it after the world, it's broken. So we need to look to God and realize that God's design is reconciliation. And so we need a filter. How are we going to filter this? Because we can't look at the world, so let's look at God's word. Paul continues in that same chapter, 12, and he gives us a little picture of, of a filter for God's way of relationship. And I just want to highlight just a couple points. This is starting in verse 14. This is our, our filter for how we should look at relationship, knowing that it's different than our way. And Paul says this. He says, bless those who persecute you. Wait, wait. That doesn't sound right. Let me, let me check it out. Bless those who persecute. No, he says it. Bless and do not curse them. That's different than the way that you and I would probably handle it. And then he says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. And what are we seeing here? We're seeing that connection and community with people should be one of our filters. God is all about relationship. God created you and I for relationship with him and with each other. And if we get this wrong, we have nothing it's all about relationship, connection, community. The world views people as, as commodities of how they can use people to get what they need to advance themselves. It's that sin and selfishness. I love to be in relationship with you because you can help me get to where I want to be. That's not what this is about. Again, God's filter is community, relationship. Then he continues saying, Don't, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So realizing filter for relationship, it's community with people because we're meant to be in a relationship and it's humility and meekness. We need to be humble in our relationships you want to be good at relationships and walking through conflict in a godly way? Be humble. Be humble. Do whatever it takes, Paul is saying, as far as it depends on you to live peaceably with one another. Jesus calls us to be peacemakers, not just peaceful, but peacemakers. It's an activity there that we have to be, we have to be involved in actually changing the, the climate, the culture. We have to change it from evil 
to good, to make peace there. So we, we look at our filter as being community with people, humbleness, humility as part of this filter. And then he continues saying, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But for us, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, we should feed them. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So again, we see this idea of, of relationship. Is, it's done in community. It's relational. We need to be humble if we want to walk through relationships in a godly, holy way and navigate conflict. But then also we see that Jesus' standard is the extra mile. Go above and beyond. You know, he's talking about serving our enemies. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them water. He talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He often talks about, man, if someone wants your shirt, give them your jacket as well. If someone wants you to walk a mile with them, go an extra mile. If someone hits you on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. You go the extra mile. Why? This is the way of relationship in the kingdom of God. For those of us who follow Jesus, it's totally different than the world. It's about relationship, community, humility, going the extra mile. And so that's the filter. But what happens when things are not right and there's conflict and then there's brokenness? Well, how do we, how do we navigate that? What do we do at this point? We have to realize God's design is reconciliation. So what do we do? Here's my encouragement. You deal with it. If there's conflict, you deal with it. Like, as soon as you can. I think of what it says in Ephesians 4. Paul, again, is encouraging the church. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So deal with it. If there's an issue between you and someone else, go and deal with it. And I know some of us, we just like to ignore the situation, hope that it's gonna get better someday. Some of you avoid people when there's conflict. You ghost people. Someone calls you and you go, ah, I don't really want to talk to that person. We're not seeing eye to eye, whatever. And so you just de decline the phone call. You decline the text. You don't respond. That is not God's way for relationship and navigating conflict. Don't ghost people. Deal with it. Deal with it soon. Paul says, don't let the sun go down. There's an urgency there. Why? Because if you let it sit, it festers and you give the devil an opportunity to grab a hold of your heart, your life, and then bitterness creeps in on you. And then you start getting eaten up from the inside. And then it's no longer your issue with that other person. You're just a mess inside. God doesn't want that for you. He wants us to deal with that as soon as we can. Paul also talks about Love in 1 Corinthians, he says, love is patient. I'm sure you've heard this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of wrongdoing. Sometimes you and I have long lists of offenses with people that we walk with and we're just waiting for the moment. That one look that someone gives you and, and then you just go, all right, all right, buddy, here's the list. For the last six years, you've been doing this, this, and this, and this, and it bothers me. And, it's, and this person's going, what? What is happening? We, we got to keep short lists, and we got to deal with the offenses as soon as we can. If you know that you've offended somebody, deal with it. If you know someone's offended you, go and deal with it. Why? Because God's design is for reconciliation. He doesn't want us carrying this hurt, this brokenness, because it gives room for the devil to eat us up to stir us up. And when you're dealing with it, own your part. This is one of the biggest things. Own your part. Even if your part in this conflict is 1%, don't sit here and go, well, that person has 99% of the problem. So once they get their act together, then I'll think about forgiving them. If they do a good job making it right. No, 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 no. Deal with it. Own your 1%, 100% of it right away. Do it. Why? Because that's God's heart. It's, his design is for reconciliation. He, he makes it clear. Jesus in Matthew 5 says this, if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, 
So you're going to God to bring your offering to the Lord. And you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. This is how much God values relationship and reconciliation. Worship to God is not honorable to him when we have conflict with one another. God's like, no, no, no. You need to go deal with that first. You, You have to. Why? Because Jesus always connects our relationship to him with others. It's the greatest commandment. You're called to love God with everything you've got and people the same. It's love God and people. One of my biggest challenges in my whole faith journey, my whole life of following Jesus, is this distinction of loving God and loving people. And you really can, they're they are matched. They have to be. If I say that I love God, but I don't love people, I don't really love God all that much because God doesn't separate the two. And if I love people like crazy... It's, a, it's an evidence of my love for God because they're so intertwined. I think sometimes you and I may fall for the trap. People are horrible. I almost said a different word, but this is recorded and being online. I almost said it. People are horrible sometimes. And so I've, I've said the statement, you know what? If it's just me and God, that's all I need. Me and God are good people are horrible. I don't need to deal with them. That is not true. That is a lie from the enemy. And and if you and I are going to continue in that, man, we are being led astray. It's not. Jesus said, love God, love people. We're called to do this in relationship with one another. If you're coming to me to worship me at my altar and you have beef with somebody else, stop. Don't worship me. Go and fix that first. Jesus is telling us relationship is amazingly important in his kingdom, and it's about reconciliation. That's his design. So we deal with it. Another helpful tip is some of us need to talk less and listen more. James says this. He says, know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. This whole idea of talking less and listening more, for me, it's the practice of curiosity. Uh, Have you ever had those moments where someone says something and it hits you sideways? Or maybe it's a a look from across the room and you're just like, "What what was that about? Sometimes when that happens to me, I immediately start filling up my mind with a story. Well, that person must not like me. What did I do? You know, I, 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 I create this whole narrative in my head. And then I'm angry at them for no reason yet because it was just a look. It was just a, 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 something they said. And so now I'm already positioning myself against them, ready to fight. And if I would just talk less and listen more and come in with curiosity and go, hey, when you said that, what did you mean? Help, help me understand. I think I'm kind of confused. It hit me a little off. Tell me what you're thinking. Or, hey, I saw you across the room. What was up with that look? Ha- have curiosity. I don't know how many times I've been ready to fight somebody and maybe have actually fought them because I just didn't pause to ask a question. I've run over people because I assumed we were in a fight And they weren't even looking at me. They were trying to read something on the wall behind me, but I was so upset that they gave me that cross-eyed look from across the room that I went in there. And if I would have just asked a question, again, realizing that it's about community, relationship, it's about having humility, all of those things, if I would have asked a question, it would have solved the conflict that was only in my heart and we could have moved forward, but I was ready. And it reminds me of Proverbs 10, it says this, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. That could be a life verse for me. Maybe many of you too. Like we just keep our mouth shut. Man, we will not sin as often. And so, man, we need to to deal with conflict when it comes. We need to talk less, listen more, ask questions, be curious, really come in as as a, with humility, 
seeking restoration. And then the, the last uh, point for today, I think, is, is this idea of we need to work towards restoration. It's, it's work. Relationship, their work. Again, sometimes they're hard, but they're so good if we work through it. And so we need to work towards restoration. If there's brokenness in a relationship, we work towards it. And this is Jesus talking in Matthew 18, and he's talking to the church. He's talking to us who follow Jesus. He says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses, you have won that person back. And so when we have an offense or there's brokenness or conflict, the first thing we should do is we should go to that person. Go to that person that we have the issue with, with the hope of reconciliation because God's design is reconciliation. So we go to that person and go, hey, something's going on here. We need to figure this out. We need to deal with it. We don't go to other people first and talk about it and figure out strategies on how to go to that person. No, because why? That breaks relationship. Jesus tells us to go right to that person. And don't do the churchy thing. I know some of you already know what I'm gonna say. Don't go and ask for prayer. Hey, can you pray for me and this other person? They said some really nasty things and they're just struggling with all of these things and I I really wanna be reconciled, but man, they just have all this baggage. Can you pray for them? that's not helpful at all. That's gossip masked as righteousness. It's not, it's a sin. Don't do it. Go to the person you have issues with and work it out with them. Then Jesus says, but if that's unsuccessful, if trying to work it out just one-on-one, then take one or two other with you and go back so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. At this point, you've tried to to negotiate it, to navigate it, to to walk through conflict in a holy way, roadblock. You bring some other people there, not as bullies to beat this person up, but people who want to see the relationship restored. And it just brings light to the situation because sometimes you and I can be in conflict and if we bring someone else, that person can go, you both are saying the same thing. Like, I don't know, they can help us navigate that. Then Jesus says, But if the person still refuses to listen, you take them to the church, the case of the church. Then if he won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Now, this is the last and worst case scenario, Jesus says. And why do we bring them to the church? Again, we're called to be in community. The body of Christ, we are one. We want to be a body that's in relationship and community, working towards health together. And so the church, Jesus, man, This is a place where we work out this stuff. And so Jesus, bring this to the church. We talk about it. And if this person doesn't repent, confess, uh, make amends, whatever the issue is, whatever the sin is, then we treat them as a pagan or a tax collector. We treat them as someone who doesn't know and follow Jesus. That doesn't mean we beat them up, but it means we treat them differently. They're not part of the body anymore. They may be close to the body, They may be someone who's gone to church their whole life but has never surrendered to Jesus. And how do we treat people who who don't follow Jesus? We love them. We extend grace and mercy and we invite them to follow Jesus. And so then Jesus kind of continues and says, I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be uh, forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit or loose on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything you ask, my father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am there with you. And this whole two or three are gathered. It's not about prayer or worship times because honestly, God is everywhere. When, if you're by yourself right now, God is with you. Talking about two or three, this is really referencing uh, back to Deuteronomy in capital cases, when they were trying people to put them to death, you couldn't put someone to death on your own witness. You needed two or three people to be in the light with you. And so Jesus is saying, I'm giving the church authority to speak, to help, because saying someone's not part of the body anymore and they're 
a pagan or a tax collector, they're outside the family, is a pretty steep thing. And so we need to have witnesses around us. And so Peter then comes after hearing all this, says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Sounds like a good number. Seven's a godly number. Uh, it seems like a lot. Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Again, this shows how Jesus and his plan for reconciliation, his design is way different than us, way bigger. And so we have to work towards this. Now, working towards reconciliation and continuing in relationship are two different things. You and I are called to be reconciled to one another. That means there's no issues. There is no animosity or anger or bitterness or anything towards us. But at that point, we can go our separate ways. We, can, uh, we don't have to be in close relationship. Relationships change, and they change all the time, and that is okay. I think of uh, my sister. When we were in the house together, we didn't get along too well. When we moved out, our relationships changed, and now we're closer. I think of if you have a friend who moves, and you guys don't see each other every day, you guys are still good. You're reconciled in relationship, but your dynamics change. Again, this is okay to see relationships change. And sometimes you can forgive somebody, but you don't have to keep allowing them to sin against you by being in close relationship. You can forgive them, be at peace with them and God, and part ways relationally. And that is okay. And sometimes it's healthy to do that. So what are we, what are we talking about? God's design is for reconciliation. So when there's conflict, we need to deal with it quickly. We need to talk less and listen more. We need to work towards restoration. And this is the gospel. This is the good news displayed. God loves you and me so much. We were created to be in relationship with him, but because of sin, that relationship was broken. But God did whatever he had to. He went the extra mile by sending his son Jesus to live a perfect life that you and I couldn't. He died a gruesome death on the cross that you and I should have. And he rose from the grave three days later, conquering sin and death, that if you and I would put our faith in him, we would be reconciled to right relationship with God. God has dealt with it so that you and I can be in relationship with him. And so uh, we have a a decision to make as as people. Are we going to surrender our lives to God and follow him and be reconciled with him and in the same way be reconciled to one another? We're going to respond Now, and it's going to be a time of worship. And worship is amazing because it's our response to who God is and what he's done. He has done an amazing thing by sending his son, Jesus. And if you have yet to put your faith in him, I want to encourage you, respond. God loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for you. He wants to be reconciled to you. He wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to know you. And so if that's where you're at, please reach out, respond. You can text us. You can go to our website, hit the connect card. You can go in the chat and just say, hey, I want to follow Jesus. Help. We would love to help you. And maybe as as we're going to worship, the words of Jesus is, is ringing in your head. Ooh, if I have conflict with somebody, I should probably deal with that now before I enter into worship. Yeah, you probably should. So maybe you need to pause this or just, just walk away and, and get on the phone. Text somebody. Maybe turn to the person right next to you. I don't know how many times I'm in conflict with my wife and I just want to forget about it and push into Jesus. And, and Jesus goes, no, 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 turn. Deal with that first. Then come and worship me. And so I want to pray for us that God would uh, help us to walk through this through conflict in a holy way, knowing that his design is reconciliation. Let me pray. God, we thank you so much. You were so good. We thank you that you dealt with our sin problem, with the gap between uh, you and us. You dealt with it. And we're so thankful, God. Help us to, to come to you, to follow you. Help us to love you with everything we got and to love people the same, God. I pray that everyone watching, God, that they would put their faith in you, that they would follow you, that they would trust you with everything they got. And God, I pray that there's um, brokenness and conflict between relationships. God, I pray that you would work powerfully in them and through them to to make uh, restoration and reconciliation. God, I pray for all of the relationships of everyone watching, God, that I pray that they would be holy because you would call us to be holy. I pray that you'd give us courage to take the first step and to deal with those things, God. We love you, God. You are so good. You are so faithful. 
and we are just overwhelmed by your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. We are called to be holy, and the world needs to see a different way of relationship, one where we walk it out in God's love, grace, and forgiveness. I think that's gonna be an image that the world is, is dying to see. So church, you know, we love you. We wanna walk with you. So whatever you need, whatever next step God is calling you to, respond today as we respond in worship. Yes. 
that we face in every corner we walk in. God, as sons and daughters, as believers, as followers of, of you, help my perspective, our perspective to be shifted to be more like you, more like yours. To remember what you've done for me, how you gave your son to die for me. that there's a whole world around us that is literally dying without knowing their Savior. Dying without knowing about hope. Help my priorities, help our priorities to be reshifted for more of what your heart desires. Jesus, I try. 